It's all right. All right, good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the June 13th, 2024 Planning Board uh, workshop meeting. Um, Noreen, can you start with a roll call, please? Bonnie Franson is out this evening. Jeff Manson. Here. He will be acting chair this evening. Pat Shea is out. Dylan Penn. Lou Rivera is out. Robert Garstack. Here. Robert will be sitting in for Pat Shea. Check, 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 check. How about now? Okay, before we begin, I'd like to point out our fire exits. There's two doors directly behind us. Through each of the doors here, if you come through this main door, out to the right, through here, out to the left, and onto the deck. If I can ask everyone to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Okay, our uh, first application tonight is a new application, 122 Ludlam Road. If the applicants can come forward and have a seat at the table. On the top, if you pull the slide switch towards you, that'll turn the microphone on. Hello. Hi. Sir, can you pull the microphone a little closer to you? It's uh, Sure. <clears throat> How is this? That's great. Thank you very much. Um, if you could introduce yourselves uh, for the record and then tell us uh, what brings you here tonight. I'm Alona Vito. I'm the owner of the house. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Robert Kutchik, the designer for Ilona and James McConnell. And we're, the application is for um, adding an accessory apartment, uh, 335 square feet, to be built into uh, the existing residence, single family residence, which is 277 square feet. So it's basically 16% of the floor plan. And that's that's the nature of the application. Okay. Special, special use. For in order to be able to, to promote sure. that. Um, can you give us an idea of what you're thinking of using the accessory apartment for? Uh, yeah, the purpose is for guests so that we have privacy, so that we'll live in one part of the house and have the other part for guests, um, potentially for a little extra income to support the ongoing maintenance of the house. Okay. Um, Sean? Do you have any comments? I do. Um, so, uh, as everyone knows, accessory apartments are permitted in all residential districts, uh, although a uh, sp site plan and special use permit are uh, required to get through the planning board for the uh, use. So I did step through all the requirements and the zoning for, uh, site, or for the special use permit. I won't bore you with all of them, but uh, there's a couple highlights. Um, the first one is is that the accessory apartment size has to be at least 450 square feet. 336 is proposed. Yeah, 335. I saw that too in the ordinances. Right. So I, I didn't know if the applicant wanted to increase the size somehow by maybe moving some interior walls or if they would like to go, I would assume, through a variance process through the ZBA to... Yeah, um, with that variance to modify the minimum size. Uh, not that you have to answer this evening, but I just wanted to raise that. Um, additionally, um, the applicant has to pr 
prove that the single family dwelling has been in existence for at least 10 years. Um, I, I think a building department record or CO for that can be yeah. provided uh, for proof. Um, a couple of notes that I asked for on the plans. Um, one of the big things in the zoning is to make sure that the facade footprint and um, essentially size of the existing dwelling is not m being modified with the exception of an exterior door being added. Uh, I just want to confirm that that is the case. We're not even adding the door. It's really already it's, it's there. It's already there. Yeah. And, and the deck and stairs that are shown, they're already there as well? They're already there as okay. well, Okay. Yeah. It's a um, real natural situation for okay, the apartment. Great. And just if you confirm that there's no site modifications being proposed? Yeah, none whatsoever. None. Okay, great. Um, so the, the only other large item that I had was the septic and well um, usage. So we will need a certification, or the, the code requires a certification by a PE be provided um, as to whether septic can handle the bedroom if it's proposed, um, but I wanted to ask you, is there an additional bedroom being proposed, or is the bedroom that's being purposed to the apartment? Yeah, the bedroom is already there and understood as a bedroom. Okay. Uh, the septic tank is 1,000 square gallon, uh, 1,000 gallon, and we do, there is a, you know, a proper uh, installation and report for that okay. at the time of the installation. Okay, so do you have, does, have you looked in the building department records whether or not you have an as-built of the septic system? Um, we, you got that from the building department, right? We have it with us. Okay, um, if you could just. The last page in the application, I attached the, what we got from the building department. I, I can look at that. Um, yeah. So I, that's something we can discuss as a board. Um, so the way septic system and well sizing is done is by bedroom count. There's no change in bedroom count. Um, so in my opinion, I don't even know if a letter is necessary to be provided because there's no change. Um, so unfortunately, Ashley, the attorney was noting that I, she doesn't think that can be waived, that provision. So I think you'll need a letter from a PE certifying that there is no need additional septic modification. Sure. Really, that was that was the ex, you know extent to the big items from my comments. Um, you mentioned that the the house needs to be in existence at least ten years. On the tax record, it's showing that the actual year built was 1934. Did, do you know that to be accurate? Yeah, that's what we were hmm. know from when we, we bought it just two years ago, almost right. two years ago. I see ago. you bought it in 22. Yeah. <clears throat> Is there something? Actually, is there something particular we would need to demonstrate that the house is over 10 years or would this uh, filing from the tax record suffice, showing that it was built in 1934? Who does say um, a CO or adequate proof? I don't recall if that record gives a date um, as far as when the... It, it I think it does, a, actually. I think it was constructed, because I think there likely isn't a CO because it was constructed so long ago. Right. So I do think that that would likely suffice to satisfy that criteria. What comments do you have for us tonight, Ashley? Or just a, a, others, and they may be in Sean's comment letter, because I know he didn't go through all of his in detail, but I'll just go through some of mine. So the floor plan needs to be by a registered architect or PE. The code also requires voting records or competent evidence that would be sufficient to establish domicile for purposes of voting. So either um, a license or government issued ID, or if, if it's not going to be voting records, something like a utility bill in your name, that kind of thing that would suffice to register to vote. 
The code does require two parking spaces per unit with a backup or turnaround area so that cars which park in the spaces are not required to back out onto the street. So I would just ask Sean to review that parking and, and confirm that that's adequate. The application also requires an owner's affidavit um, attesting that you'll abide by certain certain standards and I we have that revised for Okay, I'll make sure Maureen can get you that affidavit that you'll need to sure, sign. Appreciate that. Um, one thing it because it does have to be owner occupied and I saw you had given a certificate of insurance that was indicating it was a short term rental unit. So I don't know if that was an older thing or um, that was uh, proof that we have home insurance. We increased our liability so that we would be covered for potential rental. Um, we started an application for the short-term rental permit and talking with our designer and planning, uh, we decided the house needed more work before we could do, go forward with that. So, um, but I, I was including that, that's really what I have as a bill, my husband's on the utility bill, so. Um, okay, so it's not, so it is owner occupied, it's not going to be used as a short term rental? Is it's that currently owner occupied, yeah, we're going to live in the, the main part of the house and rent just a part of it. Okay. Yeah. So you will need something to demonstrate the, the domicile, if it's you or your husband, if you're both, you know, the owner, if yeah. you have something that's in one of your names or, or voting records to show that. Uh, should I ask that question now about like when do I need that? Um, yeah, Elon is just wondering about when you would need those, those kinds of documents, proof of primary occupancy, residence. So it would be needed before you'd be able to get a final approval. So typically the board would want to see those before they issue an approval. Sure. Okay. If it's something that potentially could be a condition, we'd have to think about that, but it would be something because that's a one of the, the bigger requirements, the owner occupancy. So <laughs> in other words. And then as far as seeker goes, it would be a type two action. And it does not refer, require referral to the Orange County Planning Board, Planning Department. It doesn't appear to be within 500 feet of a municipal boundary or any other trigger. Again, due to this square um, um, requirement that's not being met, the applicant will need to either increase the square footage or seek an area variance. I'm sorry, I was listening to Alona. Could you repeat the last sentence? Please? Sure. It was discussed earlier by by the engineer that the size of the apartment would either need to be increased or you would need to go to the ZBA for a variance. Yeah, I'm bringing up whether that's uh, obligatory be, uh, only because of the kind of the lay of the apartment. All we're adding to make this accessory apartment is one three and a half foot wall. And to change that by adding more square footage would kind of cut into like, you know, primary space, kitchen space, hallway space. And you would need to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, that's a separate board from this one, mm -hmm. and you would need to get an area variance in order to reduce the minimum habitable space requirement. And you would need to do that before you could get approval from this board. Okay. And to start that process in motion, or to call you, I thought that answer was coming. Yeah. I can get the application. Okay. For this evening, some action items you could take would be to classify the application as a type two under seeker. And if you wanted to refer the applicant to the ZBA for that variance. If that's what they, still an option for them to change the floor plan as well. Yeah, I'll discuss that. With right, the I mean, that's a decision you're going to need to make. Which way they want to go. Um, just before I go to the rest of the board, I'm not sure if I'm remembering right, but I see there's a um, a door from the accessory apartment to the main dwelling. Is that permitted under the code, Ashley? 
I, I just, I feel like that came up in the past with an accessory apartment, but it's been a while since we've done one. <coughs> Excuse me. And I can understand why, if you're using it as space for guests in particular, yeah, where exactly. that would make sense to have a, a door to do that. I don't believe there's a restriction on that, but it does require a separate entrance mm -hmm. to serve the accessory apartment. Okay. And also the structure can only have one front entrance and only one entrance from any other facade. Yeah, that's already in place, yeah. Dylan, any questions or comments that you have? No, Bob? I, I do, I'm just not clear. Are you planning on having this separate apartment as a short, eventually, as a short-term rental? Um, we're kind of taking things step by step. I, I think it would be, e I've got a three-year-old daughter, it would be easier to just have one person in there at this point. Um, we've looked into the requirements for a short-term rental and um, that would be uh, in the future. Actually down the Yeah, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be staying there and uh, you know, guests could be my parents, James's parents. Um, yeah. <laughs> Look. In law suite is what you call it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I kept that on the plan. It exists, that door, you know, into the primary space, but is for to give, <clears throat> give them as many options as possible for flow of, you know, who the guests are in that. And then just to close it off. And I also couldn't find any requirement that I had to shut it shut it off completely. There are just two. Are there two entrances, two exterior entrances, or are there three? I thought I saw one by the laundry room as well. There's that's to the you know primary space, the laundry room entrance, and then there's one the main entrance. It's on the south side. It might appear as the back. That's the primary entrance. Then the only other one is the one that's gonna be used for the accessory space. Oh, does um, say that the structure shall have, um, so the structure, meaning the dwelling, shall only have one front entrance, so you have that one primary entrance, and only one entrance from any other facade of the structure. So it does appear to limit you to two entrances. The way I understand that is a second entrance is permissible. Are you suggesting that in order for them to be able to add the separate entry for the accessory apartment, they'd have to eliminate the entrance for the laundry room? Yeah, the accessory entrance exists. It's there, right? I would have to... It, the way I read it, limiting the number of entrances to the apartment, it's not limiting the entrances to the primary space. That's, okay. That's, what I the, the, that's the way I read it. That's what I thought as well, but I said it's been a little while since we've gone down the road of an accessory apartment. All right. I'm, so it sounds like certainly our biggest issue is that we're not meeting the minimum requirements. Um, yeah. It's going to... Uh, need a variance if, if we're not going to change the plan. Bob, did you have any other questions before? Oh, I, I don't. Forward? All right. I, I mean, I'm certainly comfortable if we uh, go ahead and I'd like to make a motion that we classify this as a type two action for the purpose of seeker so we can get that taken care of. May I have a second? Second. Can I get a vote on that, Noreen? Bob Garza. Aye. Jeff Manson. Aye. Dylan Penn. Aye. 
And actually, we would need a motion to uh, refer them to the ZBA. Okay, would somebody like to make that motion? I will make a motion to send this to the ZBA for approval. And, and the applicant's confirming that that's what they want. They're not gonna look back to see if there's any other option to expand at this time. Well, it doesn't commit them. It doesn't yeah, commit them to, to do that. that then okay. they just won't, won't right. act on the referral. Okay. Right. Or, so we'll move forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I trust his design. She would, He's she really would know if she wants yeah. that or not. Yeah. Is there any other kind of categorization, like, you know, minor accessory or where you can have less square footage? No, it's the minimum is 450. Maximums, it's 750 or a percentage of the, the dwelling, but yeah. the minimum is, is okay. there. We'll work with that. We would decide to make the referral tonight just as a point of expediency because otherwise then they would need a referral from the building inspector. They'd have to go back to Ben to be able to go forward or can you apply right to the ZBA? I guess is it necessary or is it beneficial to the applicant if we do that? Is my question. I think it would be beneficial to make it clear that they're able to take that next step should they choose to. Great. I'll second Bob's motion. Noreen? Bob Garstack? Aye. Jeff Manson? Aye. Dylan Penn? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions you have for us at this time? Um, no, it's, it's quite clear. Just um, for the PE report on the septic, you know, we can get that written up and give them to Noreen, correct? All right, anything from your side? Okay. And the same for the proof of domicile and the yeah. affidavit, that's all through Noreen? Yep, I'll get send you the, so I already made a note okay. to send you that and the ZBA app. There's also comments that the engineer makes. Um, I will email them to you. I don't have them with me this evening. So you emailed them, see I can't access from here. So I'll send them to you so you have everything that he okay had for the notes from tonight's meeting. All right. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for your time. We're not here tomorrow, so we're on summer hours effective this evening. So I'll be back in the office Monday at 7.30 a.m. Okay, thank you. It's so been very helpful, after that. appreciate it. Our next application is a change to the site plan for Home Depot. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Doran Ballon with Kimley Horn on behalf of the applicant, Home Depot. Um, we're looking to propose to stripe off outdoor storage areas within the Home Depot parking lot and around the store perimeter. Um, this is in response to violations from the town's uh, building and fire inspector office. Um, these improvements will create a net loss of 26 parking stalls on site. Um. And what kinds of items are going to be stored? Is it going to vary, or is it a particular? Um, it varies. It's it's all you know merchandise for sale within the parking lot and the front of the store. Um, things like you know lawn mowers, barbecues, um, and then they're also going to have the Penske truck rentals out in the parking lot and the plant corrals during the summer. Will it be a seasonal use or year round or both? Um, they're all going to be permanent storage. Okay. Sean? Um, so again, I, I won't drill down on every single comment I have, but um, so I understand this, as the applicant noted, they, this is coming from a series of notice violations for storage of items within the fire, the striped fire lane. Um, so I, I think it's important that this plan get referred to both the fire inspector, meaning Ben, the build, as a building inspector slash fire inspector, as well as the jurisdictional fire department. Uh, for, for review and comment. Um, so a couple of item, other items, um, a portion of the modifications are gonna be made within the village of Monroe because, uh, excuse me, within the village of Woodbury because the line runs through the parking lot and a 
portion of it is within the village of Woodbury. So, you know, I asked the applicant to make an application to the village um, for site plan modification there as well. Um, corrals that are noted within the description of all the areas, are, are any of them going to be fenced in? Um, no, there's no proposed fencing no, at the moment. Okay. Um, so then procedurally, well, I guess one more item. In the back, there is a noted water easement that's running through the property. A portion of the storage area will be located on the easement. So I ask that the applicant reach out to the owner of the easement to ensure that they're okay, you know, get written acceptance of the plan to um, store items on top of the easement. Um, and then that's for storage area J, correct? Um, okay, yes. Gotcha. So the applicant notes that the application will require a variance for parking. So currently, the parking count is less, what's, pro what's provided is less than what's required by the zoning code. And they're actually decreasing the number of parking stalls that are there. Um, so they will need um, a variance from the ZBA. So I, I think the board can refer them, if, for, refer the applicant to the ZBA at this time. Um, and then secondly, the applicant noted the number of ADA stalls is currently deficient from what's required. I'm not aware of a, of a means of obtaining a variance from that. Um, so I believe the applicant should propose striping modifications to meet the minimum ADA space requirements. And I think that's important to do before it goes to the ZBA because it could impact the number of parking space variants or the, the, the number of varied spaces that the, is being sought with the application. Do you know how many ABA spaces, ADA spaces they're deficient? Six, I think 20 are required and 14 are existing. Yeah, that's correct. There's there's 14 existing and there's 19 required, so they're oh. deficient by five. Five, yeah. So as the parking spots reduce, <clears throat> does that do anything to change the deficiency level, or is it just by uh, it, is it, it by could increase use? because yeah. um, they're gonna it's gonna need a um, the loading stall adjacent mm -hmm. to the a number of parking stalls, so it could impact it, uh, meaning increase the the variance that's required one thing we were curious about is um typically we find with these um you know commercial big box retailers and shopping centers that um the parking calcs are based on the shopping center as a whole um we did them based on just the home depot parcel which is why it's extremely under parked um is there any chance that we could look at the calculations from um the commons as a whole to see if we can maybe avoid going in for a variance? I noted that in my, in my comments as whether or not a cross parking easement exists for the whole, for all the parcels. And I defer to council, but if that exists, I think that could be looked at. Okay. Well, and my question in relation to that is, um, do we have any authority under the code to look at the number of parking spaces without it going to the ZBA, or does only the ZBA have that jurisdiction? Parking is a little little complicated. There is, I believe, cross parking easement. I know we had, you may recall, we had a few applications not too long ago, one being Target with their outdoor storage containers and another being um, the, the end space for, for another building up by Target that became the 
the restaurant space. So at that time, the applicants had to show that there was sufficient parking elsewhere under, you know, the whole allotted parking under the original site plan approval. So I think a similar type analysis would be appropriate or necessary in order to find that a variance wouldn't be required. And that would have to take into account those prior analyses as well. So say Target already eliminated some of their spaces, so that now has reduced the overall count that was originally part of the site plan. So it would be, it may be a little um, complex to, to go through and make sure that we have, you know, the applicant has all of those records to be able to determine whether there's any or sufficient available parking after removing what's already been removed. I think Walmart was another one with their um, the online pickup, I think had eliminated some, so. That's an issue. Oh, because parking spaces all right, part of the parking space is being converted to green space in order to provide for um, there to be more paved surface permitted across the inner ring road for right, both so the and gas I, stations. And I think they had done also an analysis at that time as well. I think well. BJ's is specific to BJ's. To BJ's, okay. right. But, I, I, it was, I, I a, think it was Depot, a trade. I think Home Depot could look at it with Walmart. Right, because parking spaces are being added on the far side of the ring road, and I think it was an equivalent number that were being subtracted over by the tire bank. Okay, so, so that wouldn't necessarily ne um, negatively impact this in the overall scheme of parking calculations if we were able to look at it that way, is what you're saying. On Ross Eastman. Eastman. Yes, I'm not sure who that was party to that. I, I'm a little curious too. So we have a deficiency of ADA spaces how, do we have any idea how that occurred in the first place? Just, okay, I didn't know if it was an issue that when the building was originally approved, I don't know Perhaps if it was. it was a, a different requirement at the time. That, that's what I'm wondering, if the requirement was different when Home Depot was originally approved, but now that we're going and we're changing the site plan, it has to meet the current. Okay. Yeah, just because I'm unaware of a, a way to, vary the number of required spaces. All right. <laughs> um, any other comments, Sean? Uh, no. Ashley? A, a few additional. These outdoor areas, are, there's no structures the goods are going to be stored in? Is it? Correct. It, it would just be the parking striping in the lot, um, but at the moment, there's no actual construction being proposed. I know Sean had touched on the need for approval from the village of, of Woodbury. If you could clearly mark the village of Woodbury boundary on the plans too, so we could see what portion is in the town and what's in the village. Yeah, there's a, there's a boundary line there, okay. but I do see it's faint, so we can make that a little bit darker. Um, one question I had is if the area B that um, abuts onto the village boundary were to be modified or shrunk so that it's no longer within that boundary, could the need of having to apply to the village be waived? There's nothing happening in the village, then you wouldn't need approval from them. It'll still be, have a public hearing, it'll get referred to the village and you certainly can refer it to the village out of ordinary course. Where's the, is that it? Here for the applicant to to uh, not have to go to two boards, but that's up to. So under seeker, it would be an unlisted action. The amount of outdoor storage spaces it exceeds four thousand square feet. So essentially, expanding a commercial facility by more than four thousand square feet, even though there's no construction proposed and it would require referral to the Orange County Planning Department because it is right on the boundary of, of the village there. The public hearing is discretionary. Does require referral? Thank you. 
Bob? Comments? No comments. Dylan? I just want clarification as to what spots the Penske operation would take specifically on the drawing. Um, that would be area A. For our benefit, uh, area A is located where? Um, kind of almost dead center in the lot. Um, it's the third row of parking stalls from uh, Plan South. In front of the garden center, the smaller portion of Stripe. Of course, that's right where I park. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have purview to suggest an alternate location? <laughs> I mean, from a cons cons consumer basis, yeah. <laughs> um, we can certainly make any suggestions that we want to make. Mm. Um, one thing that I noticed when I was over there yesterday was in what I believe is the northeast corner of the lot, again, closer to, closer to the inner ring road, um, and, the, and the, at the intersection where it... Um, has the entrance to Home Depot on the far side by the Pro Center. There's four or five pieces of heavy equipment parked there right now, uh, back hose, that kind of thing. And what, I, what I'm wondering is, um, is there a project going on over there and Home Depot has allowed them temporarily to park that equipment there? Is that, are those pieces of heavy equipment that Home Depot rents out, in which case they're there on a regular basis, um, or are they allowing another, are they allowing like a construction company to park their equipment on that part of the lot? One way or the other, if, if those vehicles are there on a somewhat permanent basis, it affects the parking calculation in, in my mind because those aren't spaces that are usable. Um, so first of all, I mean, depends, depends on what's really going on with that equipment. And so is that a permitted use, number one? And number two, um, is that going to affect the overall space count as well? Because that should be part of our um, referral to the ZBA, I would think. Okay. Um, so that, if you can find out some more information about that for next time. Yeah, I, I will say Home Depot does um, rent out large format equipment. I can't say for sure if those four specific uh, vehicles are um, their property or someone else's, so I can look into that. It is something that they do regularly do if it's in the town that should be then proposed you know the area where those are going to be stored if it's not already on the on the list there right questions for us at this point uh, no I think with this being um, a more fire hazard, just curious to, you know, see the fire marshal's comments, um, see if what we're showing is permissible. Um, but we'll definitely look into the parking, see if we have to proceed with the ZBA and go from there. I think we should wait to refer it, though, to the both the ZBA and the fire, just until you get us a revised plan. Uh, if you're looking to eliminate the portion within the village, if you're looking to modify some striping to propose where the equipment storage would be, should the equipment be utilized by Home Depot. So just, just so I'm clear, we're looking to mitigate the notice of violations of items being stored in a fire lane or fire boundary in addition to adding storage area that is currently parking, correct? Because we have to correct. displace what's being stored and we're adding the Penske operation. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next application is superior packing. Good evening.
Okay, it's been a while since we've uh, seen this application. <laughs> if you just reintroduce yourselves Please. and um, bring us up to date. Okay. Looks like we've had some significant sure. changes from the original plan we saw. Uh, I'm Larry Toro, Civil Tech Engineering. This is Tom Bard with uh, Barton with Judas. Hi. Yeah. Uh, Tom Baird, B-A-I-R-D. Why don't you go over uh, where we're at at this point in the process? I, I assume since Harriman was the lead agency on this, you've been before them and working with them to uh, get to the point we're at? No, not exactly. Okay. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll let Tom take the specifics, but basically we've been working on the wetland issues on site, right? And this, the issue with the buffer and whatnot. So we've been back and forth. We did a delineation. The town, the town consultants have come out and uh, verified it. There was some slight modifications, and we've been adjusting the plan accordingly. So what we're looking to do is work with some type of variable buffer. And before we get into specifics or the uh, details of the plans, we want to try to nail down the footprint of the building, the road, et cetera. And we haven't been to Harriman on this issue for the simple reason that it's a town of Monroe issue. As far as the wetlands come. As far as the wetlands. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in uh, working back and forth with David Tompkins and John Greaves from CHA, um, it, there was a, a review, and then they, our our wetland person met them on site for a third review, and they came to an agreement. Some of the areas uh, that got extended slightly closer to the proposed building. And um, what we had proposed originally to uh, Dave and John was to um, do a mitigation for any wetlands that may have been within the 100-foot buffer area. Um, and with John's experience and, and, and mine, we looked and really determined that it would be a shame to damage good wetlands to get in to make other wetlands. So at his suggestion, there's a number of isolated areas that aren't wetlands on the, on the site, but they could become wetlands naturally through a forested system. But um, it, wasn't, it wasn't prudent to get into those areas and destroy wetlands just to create more wetlands. And we only have a, a small areas that really are within the 100 feet. Um, they're, they're forested wetlands, they're high quality wetlands, but they're not a pond, they're not water, uh, anything like that. It's habitat and appearances. So um, with uh, John and David, we had a, a conversation, Sean, I believe, was on that call as well, where um, they would be okay with a variable buffer um, with the minimal areas that we really do have encroaching past the bu uh, buffer area. What do we mean by a variable buffer? Um, most of the, half of the, the site um, will be outside the 100 foot buffer, and the buffer would go down to at a, a minimum of about 35 feet in a, uh, a very small short area of about 50 feet. So just short stretches. It's kind of like if you think of the old amoeba and the pseudopod is reaching out, that little foot that comes out, it's kind of kind of like that when you look at the figure. Um, so um, we, you know, in the, in the spirit of preserving wetlands and definitely the natural habitat and all that, um, we came to the conclusion that it wouldn't be a detriment for those isolated areas being that close especially that any kind of stormwater runoff from this will be treated multiple times and infiltrated and not actually get into the, any of that wetland area. Um, so we have multiple ways that we can achieve that. And once we uh, nail down this, this wetland buffer and all that, we'll, we'll proceed with, with those submissions on how that would be accomplished. So, um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? No, we've, uh, we've massaged the building. Uh, we, the, the, our client was looking for a little bit more expansion, but understands that in order, in the, in the spirit of doing the best we can with the wetland, that we're building will be a little bit smaller. Um, we've extended a little bit larger in, in the Harriman section, um, but uh, we've also modified the parking so it's more efficient, so we can cut down on the pavement as well. So, um, you know, with that, um, we also, I've located the entrance onto Bailey Farm Road in the best possible way it can be located. If we go any more to would be the west away from the site, 
the grades get to where it's not really feasible to do that, and, the, and it's the, the grades for the trucks too as well. So we've really finessed the parking. We're going to extend a little bit of retaining walls just to make it work and, and have areas around the building to get have access. So uh, um, that's, that's pretty much it. John? So I, I just kind of concentrated my review to the, you know, wetlands impacts and, and making sure that this plan could actually be built. Um, so that the, the buffer can kind of be locked in. Um, so uh, I did, uh, and to start off, I did refer the application to Dave Tompkins, not until this morning. I, I just realized that he wasn't on the, the submission. So that did get to Dave Tompkins this morning and you know asked for his input on the, uh, on the revised plan. Um, so just a couple reactions to the plan. Um, there is no grading on, the, on this plan. So, I just ask that those, that be added to ensure, or so the board is informed as to how wide the buffer actually is, um, because the grading obviously would not be within the buffer. Um, regards to uh, stormwater, um, you know, obviously the the application requires a SWIP. There's no stormwater facilities shown, nor have they been checked, so um, that could impact the buffer as well. Um, and then lastly. Uh, with regards to the truck access, um, it, there may be enough room for the trucks to get into the loading docks, but if you look to, to the south of the building, I'm not sure if the trucks can make the turn out to come to go towards, back towards the highway. Um, and I thought the intent of all the circular counterclockwise around the building. so. Uh, I just ask the, that the applicant look at those spaces to the south. Yeah, we, d we definitely will. Um, the, the turning template so they can make it, it is a difficult okay. turn, but we have, uh, there's a lot of room to make the maneuverability. Okay. We didn't, we didn't focus on that exact circulation path just because the wetlands is really driving the, right. the design. It, yeah, my, my concern is if, if the maneuverability has to, or the pavement has to change, it could impact the wetland buffer. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, we have um, that. All that parking is in the the Harriman section for the trucks down there. So, and and without that hundred foot requirement there, we can move right, in closer. But as you impact the pavement, you impact the stormwater, which I assume will go in the pocket, which then could impact the buffer as well. So, yeah, we're we're actually looking at infiltration and and under temporary storage underneath the pavement. Um, I, the national expert on porous asphalt, um, and um, there's there's three or four different ways that we can achieve this without any water getting out of the site. So, yeah, so the, all of that will be very detailed and provided to you um, okay. once we can, if we know we can move forward with this footprint close, or at least close to it. Damn. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I'm, I'm with you, Sean, on that. We'll, yeah. we'll make, make it um, work. So then just a remind, I have a comment in here to remind the board. Um, Ashley and I had met with the, the village uh, and their consultants back in, June of 2022 um, and we kind of the applicant asked us to kind of divide what each board would be looking at um, so the village as you know is the is the lead agency um, but they're going to be looking at traffic water lighting noise and stormwater and then the town would be looking at stormwater landscaping wetlands and lighting um, as you know, the stormwater is on both, and that's because both municipalities are what's known are as MS4 municipalities. So both municipalities have to sign off on the stormwater review before construction can start. So, I'm sorry, Town of Monroe is stormwater, lighting, wetlands, and <coughs> and and what was what was the former? Uh, traffic, water supply, lighting, noise, and stormwater again. to concentrate as to who would have the greater impact. I think because this is kind of my realm, it, I understand the impact because it's kind of their water supply verse, but the picture as a whole should at least be reviewed. You know, we may not be uh, the yes or no, but 
I think it was more for the the consultants to review, not a, not so much the boards. The boards, you know. I, I think it's all, like an expedition all. thing for from the applicant, but I definitely would you would want to see the whole picture, of course, of the project. Mm -hmm. Um, one question I have is I think I see about 10 docks currently at the facility. Typically, how many trailers are stored not in those docks? Well, <coughs> there is space for, uh, well, to the uh, opposite the loading docks. You'll see there for trailers that yep. are, are inactive. But currently, it's five docks. Before oh, the, oh, the existing right, the, the existing yes. is five docks and 15 30. trailer spaces in existence. Yes, correct. correct. Okay. Ashley? So as far as the wetland buffer goes, as you know, it's a 100-foot buffer typically in your code. There is ability to vary that based on... Uh, specific conditions relating to topography, slopes, soils, et cetera. So it's not clear to me whether the applicant's asking to waiver that, uh, vary that buffer, reduce it based on site-specific conditions, or if you're instead seeking a wetlands permit to disturb the areas of the buffer in this varied fashion as you're, you're showing. I think it's likely the latter. Um, We're looking for the, the waiver of the 100-foot buffer. Or to reduce the to reduce the 100 feet to a variable buffer where we have some areas were 200 feet away, but in very isolated locations, we're down to 35, 40 feet. Um, that that vary, the uh, variance to allow us to do that is what we're looking for. Um, we really don't want to disturb any other wetlands. Not of the wetlands, but a, a wetlands permit would be required to disturb the buffer area. So if you're going to be disturbing, say, you know, 20 feet into the, the buffer, I guess I don't know whether this has been discussed with Dave Tompkins as far as which path. I'm not sure whether it this, qualifies. This under was the Dave's suggestion to modify the width of the buffer. Under that provision? Uh, yeah. Um, correct. Okay. If you, I really also there are many comments just about land, but some outstanding things I have from our last meeting is that your project opening forms, site visit consent, your GML disclosure, those documents identify the village of Harriman parcel, but not the town of Monroe parcel. So those should be updated. There's also parking in the front yard setback, and that's not required under the, not allowed under the code. So either a variance would be required or you would have to modify the, the parking to the area that's, um, in front of the existing building, some there's parking proposed in front. The board. In the existing conditions? Not the existing conditions. The, um, the I think proposed. it's, is that, I thought that's proposed. Proposed, yeah. proposed okay. You're talking about the parking spaces closest to Bailey Farm Road? Okay. Board does have architectural review authority, so when you get to that point, I know you're still trying to work out the wetland issue, but just a reminder, you'll need to submit all the architectural details as well as a tree plan. Dylan, questions, comment? Yes, you mentioned uh, possibility of subsurface retention or alternatives, does that mean the facility expansion is following lead certification or possibly obtaining lead certification? It's not out of, not out of the question. Um, we just don't have enough information on it yet. And mm -hmm. this, that's a really big part of it. So, okay. Uh, but um, you know, we'll definitely talk about it with our client, and uh, you know, we do have lead certified people on staff at our company, so we could we could pursue that. Fantastic. Okay, so. No other questions. Um. I'm reviewing the plans, but I, I guess my biggest question is, I understand that the proposed expansion is to bring storage on site so that they're not trucking things back and forth exactly. from one spot to the other, and that 
essentially it's warehouse space, not production space. That's correct. However, um, from what I read, typical shift is around 100 workers, and the building is being expanded almost twice the size, and we're more than doubling the number of loading docks, and we're expecting to add about 10% to the number of employees. And I'm just not sure that I understand 10 additional employees um, servicing that number of loading docks, frankly, having worked in a couple of warehouse situations myself, um, in including been a picker at Wakefern. So I'm... Um, and, and that goes to the parking calculation. You know, I get that it's two spaces required for every three workers, if I remember correctly. Correct. Um, so there's more spaces provided than what the expected head count will be for employees. Yes. My question is, is that employee count really realistic? Because that's what goes into, do we need all these spaces, number one, or is it sufficient spaces? So I, I guess I'd like to get some information from the applicant on why 10 employees will suffice um, for the unloading of trucks, for the, um, for the warehousing of all of the merchandise that is being packed into this additional expansion area. Um, obviously not having seen the interior architecturals, Will the back wall of the existing space be completely blown out? Will this be all one open area, or will it pass through from one area to the other? Is it a separate space that's being added with access from one point to the other, or, or are we literally incre increasing the entire floor space and it's going to be open all the way, which, which of course, would allow for more flexibility in how things are laid out and that, that sort of stuff. But I mean, we could ver obviously verify that with the applicant. But my initial first guess would be that they would have certain areas where they have passed through doors instead of taking all the wall out. Instead of taking the whole wall. Yeah. Um, if I could comment on the employees, please. possibly. Um, uh, uh, what we were told by our applicant, too, is that a, a lot of these employees are already already exist, and they, they're at different facilities and moving in trucks and moving things around. Those employees would then become permanently stationed at the site here, so they're already existing employees. And the additional employees... Um, help cover the overlap and the shifts. The extra spaces are for when someone arrives early and someone's leaving late, the over overlap like that. So I we, thought about that as well. Yeah. And, right. And, and there's definitely many more spaces here than required uh, by, by about 40. Um, okay. So some, some, of those, some of those employees really exist, but their function is going to change because rather than moving stuff back and forth from this building to another building, they're going to be able to move stuff internally. Okay, yes. and, so and those, that time. makes sense. <laughs> and, less, yeah. If I could just ask, and those employees are included in the in the hundred plus or minus that exist. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Is it open bay warehouse expansion, or is there a warehouse automation planned? They didn't mention anything about automation. Um, it's um, all what we've been told, and what we understand now is just packing and. and and they'll move things in off the docks and then stockpile and have it available. Mm -hmm. A lot of the spaces here, too, will be trucks that may, they may sit for weeks um, and in, in a space. So they're neatly arranged and they look uniform. So instead of, you know, they're out there on the grass right now, a lot of them. So uh, in a few, a few cases. So that's also the, the docks, um, the, the reason for the number of additional docks as well. There's a lot less trucking will be going on, being able to just come to one place instead of multiple locations like they have. So, you know, we, we think from the from the traffic standpoint, it it, it could very well help uh, in, in other areas that are, aren't exactly on this location, other parts of the town and village as well. So we'll have all of that analysis done when, when we move forward with the kind of the layout and the circulation. We have all the existing counts. We've gotten data from DOT. Our uh, our friends at AKRF had done a adaptive traffic signal control on the whole area. We have all that data, uh, but we'll and we'll put that in the traffic report, which will be very detailed to let you know everything. Um, so, right, I, and I understand that that's going to fall mostly under Harriman's purview. I think for our purposes, we'd want to 
have an understanding of what the existing condition is now with the number of trucks in and out of the site and what it's expected to be, right? Because there's going to be a reduction of certain kind of traffic and an increase of other type of traffic. Yes. Okay. Um, One of the, the, the parking area that you see in the new area too is, is critical because a number of their employees come via van and the pick up and drop off area is important and there's not overlap too. So we do have a lot of maneuverability for the vans and then also for emergency equipment to get in there if there are still vans there. So that arrangement is kind of set up that way to help help with the pick up and drop off with the vans. So. I mean, again, obviously that's variable depending on who the employees are at any given time, but yes. have any idea what percentage of the employees come by van rather than I don't want to speculate, but it was okay. very important to them to have that area, and, and quite a few do. So it's not a random van here or there. It seems to be a number of them. We can get that information for you, though, uh, definitely. And it would be definitely in the traffic study report. Uh, all that will, will be in there. It's an important element of it, for sure. What other questions do you have for us at this point so we can help you move this forward? Um, we'd, we'd like to uh, get some, some type of direction on the potential of having this uh, variable wetland buffer. Um, and th that way we can uh, proceed with more of the detailed engineering to get these, a lot of these answers question, qu questions answered and then submitted for review so we can move forward. A, a little hesitant, they're you know, concerned that the 100 foot is here and we don't really have too much of a building if we, we, we can't get some kind of uh, give and take on this. And, and um, so that's really what we're looking for. Bob, any thoughts on that? Oh, I think. Dylan? No. Any input from our. Uh, attorney at this point in that regard. Like Bob, I, I do feel like we're, we're missing a little information on that and, and really I'd like some information from our consultant, Dave Tompkins, on what the impact would be of making that decision uh, and to do a variable buffer. I, I think that there's something to be said about having an intelligently designed um, layout of your site plan and being as efficient and effective as possible. And I think that there's some, some nice changes here in, in what we're seeing. Um, and while I get, right, I get that, you know, at, at points we're 200 feet away and we have a buffer that doesn't necessarily mitigate the areas where it's 35, 40 feet. Absolutely. And so I think getting uh, a better understanding of that from our wetlands consultant would help us make that decision. Understood. So if, if we can get that kind of information from Dave, I think then we can have a, a more intelligent discussion and, and um, not only that, kind of make a decision on that so that you really have a direction to go forward with. Again, the, the variable buffer was Dave's suggestion for this, so. Right, so I'm not necessarily thinking that Dave would come back at this point and said, don't do this, but I want to know what the rationale is. Of course. I think, that, I think that's where my issue is. Does that make sense, gentlemen? Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I'm going back to the LEED certification because part of that process is management of waste and stormwater runoffs. So I just want to confirm that, uh, and that's kind of more of the methodology of design to obtain that type of certification. So we'd want to see if that's aligned, kind of check in the box 1A and see if we can go on the same path. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just procedurally. Yeah. Is it you'll coordinate with Dave and then get back to us or do we come to another meeting once you coordinate with Dave? How do you want to handle that? Would, the board's okay. I can forward on Dave's comments to the applicant once received. Yeah. Okay. We can discuss those at, once we have you know, next month and I think we can, uh, barring anything else, uh, let you know what direction we're heading with that. Okay. All right? Thank you very much.
And our final project for this evening is the return of Eagle View. Couldn't resist. No, I couldn't. Good evening, David. If you'll introduce yourself for Hello, our record. Uh, David Nimatko. I'm the architect, or our office, the architectural firm handling the project, and has been for probably a good long time. <laughs> so um, uh, happily though, we're back because it's our understanding that there was an interpretation uh, approved that would allow septic facilities on, the, on these two lots uh, since the central sewer system is not accessible at this moment. As a result, we did perk tests on site as witnessed by MH&E. Uh, the perk rates were not bad, so we laid out a, a septic system that uh, matches those perk rates and matches the amount of bedrooms in each house. Uh, a, um, and that's really the biggest change. I mean, if we think about it, the driveway entrances, the driveways, the house locations have been the same for probably two years or more. You know, uh, it's the, the difference in this application would be the septic uh, location and the two well locations. It, the last set of comments we received from MH&E, uh, from Sean, uh, were based uh, back in July 13th of 2023. We addressed those in our cover letter, point for point, and um, I'm believing we're at a point where we can uh, move this project along. Actually, why don't we start with you for this uh, application, just to mix it up. Thanks. So since the applicant has been before you last, they did, there was that interpretation that David mentioned, and then actually the town did change the law so that it um, reflects that interpretation consistent with the code. So you are able to have septic systems provided you meet certain criteria. Um, the lot's not part of a major subdivision. It's been existing for at least one year. Uh, the licensed professional engineer has to certify and the town engineer has to verify that based upon soil testing and review of the septic system that the lot can be occupied, wastewater disposed of without resulting in a danger to public health or personal property, and that adequate separation distance exists to uh, public and, and private wells. So that certification is something that's going to need to be provided and, and verified by, by Sean. Um, the... Lakes Road is a scenic road, and I know we had discussed this, and I need to get you the scenic buffer road map note, which I did see your email on that, so I will get you that information. Is the scenic buffer zone designated on the plan? We, I didn't we did think the 100 it was. Foot buffer from the lake. And that's and the, yeah, so the scenic buffer zone itself has to be designated, so the code explains how to calculate that. It's a distance from the right of way. 25, 25 feet. Which section is that? It's 5721.4.4 is the whole scenic buffer zone, so it's in that, that section. It also discussed that there's no trees proposed to be removed on this application, so you'd be seeking a waiver of the tree plan requirement, but if you could add a note on the plan saying that there's no tree removal, that's, I, that's perfect. I think we Oh, fair price. I'm almost sure we did uh, on the project notes. I think it said, I saw a note that no trees over a certain size can Six be removed without a permit, but, but I yeah. think we want to make it clear that there's no tree removal as part of the subdivision itself. And I'll get you the, um, again, the scenic buffer map note and also tree preservation map note. On sheet C3, there's some notes there, and note one should be revised to indicate that the lots do have a shared driveway entrance. And you will um, 
require an, an easement and shared maintenance agreement for the, the shared driveway entrance. The other thing we had discussed is the disturbance to that wetland buffer. It's limited to just for the driveway construction. So there's that calculation as long as um, the intrusion is less than 25% of the wetland area. So I don't know if you have that calculation somewhere on the plan, but I could give you the, the code section for that is 56-6B2. And just some procedural items. So, Seeker, it is an unlisted action. You had, when, when the plan changed from the three lot to the two lot, you did declare your intent and you assumed lead agency um, last summer and the applicant has, with this latest submission, submitted a revised EIF part one that addresses the current proposal. So the board will have to make a determination of significance based on that. I think the, the septic certification is something you'll want in order to do that as, long, as well as addressing any comments Sean has. It does not require referral to the county. The original project did, but since then the town's entered that agreement with the county that exempts subdivisions that are fewer than five lots. And there's no um, structures or roads within the 100 year floodplain. And then it would require a public hearing. Sure. Um, so, um, as David had mentioned, the um, septic testing was performed on the site. However, the testing was performed at existing grade, so as if the septics were to be put in with no cuts, but on each lot, there's a three to six foot on lot one and a four to eight foot cut across the property, so the testing is kind of invalid because that soil is going to be removed. Um, so that testing will have to be performed at the proper elevation. Do you wanna? Yeah, uh, I, yeah let, I'd like to talk about that. The, the saw profile uh, that we did all the way down was pretty consistent. Uh, so, and if we don't disturb that area or compress the soil, I think we can make it a condition of once the, the grading's done, it could be reperked at that time. Uh, to go out there to bring, to start to grade the site down towards that road would be a significant impact on the land. Uh, That's not what I'm asking. I, I think we need to do some additional pit, deep pit tests to go down to ensure that there won't be any groundwater or rock below the septic to make sure that the septics are even viable before the subdivision's approved. Well, the, the, the deep holes were done. In, in that area. Right, but not to the proper depth. Eight foot? Um, you have to go, so the on lot two, you have an eight foot cut. Six. So you have to go four feet down to at least to ensure that there's adequate separation. But the obvious concern, because, uh, you know, if you allow the applicant to get the subdivision approval and then the septics can't be built, there's no sewer for the project, so. Um, so I've got some comments on the, on the retaining walls, relatively minor. Um, there is a sewer lateral proposed out to Walton Terrace um, that the applicant has removed the installation of the sewer lateral at this time. Um, I'm not sure it's a code requirement whether or not that should be installed at this time. Uh, it may make it easier on the homeowners in the future if it is installed and as the prospective other homeowner uh, located on Walton Terrace that the, is, uh, could be built. Um, so, you know, I, I defer to the board whether or not you want to require that that be installed at this time. Um, one uh, suggestion for the applicant so as you know, the, the driveway is shared coming off of Lakes Road for quite some time into the property. Uh, maybe in order to avoid future uh, friction between the homeowners, there could be a visible barrier within the roadway, and maybe that's flush-mounted curbing. Um, 
between the driveway so they know who's responsible for which side, just merely a suggestion. Um, Ashley already noted that the curb cut would require a uh, shared maintenance agreement, but this is a means to maybe lessen the friction that could, th that could be created by that uh, uh, arrangement. While you're discussing that, I was under the impression that once you got um, beyond the right of way, that the driveway couldn't be shared at that point, that it had to be split there, but that's not what we're seeing in this case. So how is this different? So this, that is generally a suggestion to get as close to the right of way as possible. This arrangement has been okayed by the D Orange County DPW, who has the ultimate permit to go out to Lakes Road. Okay. Um, it's, it's a little bit further than I would like to see to not meet that code requirement. However, both driveways could be built separately as shown, and the curb cut within the right of way would just be built um, as proposed currently. Uh, so is it a little bit more than I'd like to see? Probably, but is it too egregious that I think it needs to meet a private road requirement? Probably not. Thank you. Um, uh, comment from my last com uh, round of comments, the wells are located behind the homes up on the hill. Um, the grading might impede the potential installation of those, of those wells up top. So I asked the applicant to make sure that those wells can indeed be installed. Um, and while we're talking about wells, the zoning co or the subdivision code requires that at least one of the wells be tested for quality and quantity prior to the subdivision. I know there is one well that's being installed that'll be abandoned in the future. Right. Um, that well could be utilized to, to do the testing, so. Prior to approval or as yes. a condition? Uh, prior, actually prior to scheduling the public hearing. See, I'm just wondering, because I know when you had started the application, it was before I was here, and I think, um, I'm, I'm not sure if Sean was here also at that time. I don't know whether you did well testing back as part of your, I, I thought maybe you, you had. We, we had done a significant amount of well testing. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I probably I think have it's it in my. Okay. I do actually see it in, so there was from Mike Donnelly's note saying that well testing was, was completed. So I think it's just a matter of locating those records. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, I remember that there was the issue with the neighbors in relation to the well testing and going to them about doing monitoring on their wells while you were doing the testing. Um, and a couple of neighbors availed themselves of that, if I remember correctly. Right. So it didn't draw down. And right. We proved that it didn't. Yeah. Um, so the applicant has shown the electric trenches now. Um, on lot two, the electric shown through the proposed septic system. Um, but considering this is a scenic road and on previous applications with scenic roads, uh, I know the board likes to try to get the electric trenches as close to the driveways as possible. So I just ask that the applicant look to see if they can reroute, kind of go along the right of way for a small portion and then maybe close to or under the driveways with the conduit and trenches. Uh, so uh, the front half of the lot is located within the town's water supply protection overlay. Um, there are a number of conditions that the board can impose on the application if you so choose, um, such as uh, restricting development within that area and, and other things. Uh, you know, you would restrict development via conservation easement. So something the board Consider W permit. Thank you. Can I get a copy of the comment, the comment letter? Both. You'll be okay. All right. Bob, question or comments? Dylan. No, thank you. Um, can the public, now that we 
talked about the well being tested. Can we go ahead with the public hearing? Get that process. I think the septic test out it that the lots aren't viable. I, I think that's instrumental to this application at this at this point. Um, I mean something so I want to understand something with the septic because the design from one house to the other is considerably different oh, in yeah. size and in and in number of runs and that sort of thing. Um, I assume, like you said, it was built and designed to the perk test. Correct. So is it because there's a significant enough difference from the one lot to the other or the layouts of where the houses are in relation to the 100-foot separation? I mean, the one, they're both four-bedroom houses, but the one on lot... I believe it's lot two is, I'm sorry. So the, the rates were different. So the, the one lot had like a and one. Your mic. Oh, sorry. The one lot had a one to five minute, well, actually had stabilized a little over a minute uh, on, on one lot. But the other lot perked, I think, between 15 and 20 minutes as a stabilized rate. So that would increase the field or increase the area of, of absorption. Um. And in a couple of spots, it looked like you were right up against that 100-foot separation from the water line, which I gather is instrumental for that. Mm -hmm. Is there any flexibility in rearranging that at all so that we're not r that close or we're really locked into what we are seeing at this point? Because of the approval... <laughs> double-edged sword, because of the approvals in place already from Orange County DPW, it's very difficult to redesign the lots. The driveway, the locations, even the house locations they mandated uh, was part of their review. And so um, it, we're, we're at a point where it's cast in stone for the most part. Right. So then it really comes down to, will those layouts work based on further testing? Yeah, we're, we're confident they will. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can understand the point, but when we did the deep hole test, the soils were consistent you know, throughout. So we're anticipating a similar range in the perk rates. And uh, you know, I was hoping that that could be a condition of, of approval. I, th I agree with Sean that in this situation, um, the septic is so uh, instrumental to the ultimate approval that we need to know that those septics will work at the depth after the grading is completed. Because that's the conditions that they're going to exist in, not the ones that, we're, that we've tested at this point. Correct? Okay. Let's put out a design concept for a moment, just to get everyone's feedback. Uh, let's, and, and again, I, I don't want to be locked into this, but it is a, a thought that came across my mind while cutting the grade to reach the uh, driveways. If we did introduce a two retaining walls, one on each side of the drive, to maintain the natural grade of the testing, is that have a garage under house on each, yeah. And then I think the testing could remain. Does, does the board but that as, raise as, the as long as the tie backs for the retaining walls would not impact the septic? Correct. The, the field itself cannot be disturbed. Right. So if we can, if we maintain the field as is, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. The if we maintain the field as is and design the retaining wall to keep that natural grade, your in the proposed grade, or to keep the natural grade on the back side. Correct. I would take no exception to that. Okay. Would Maybe. that raise the overall elevation of the buildings on the on the sites where they're going to be? They, 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 the way I understand the grading to be, it, it sort of creates a bowl effect in the back, and the houses are set down into that. One of the original things that we talked about when this came back 
you know, when we were first talking about this and it was going to be a three house is the benefit of locating the houses further back just because of the views that you're going to get from that property because it's so wide open. Would the houses sit up a little higher and take advantage of some of the existing views or are they still going to sit down into that bowl? Well, no, they're sitting up. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, but you're referring to the cluster development design that was proposed years ago and yeah, it didn't yeah, yeah. work out. Right. So it's... That push, no. But by not having that, it pushed the houses forward and, sure. and lower down in elevation, and you lose some of the sightline benefits from the houses that way. I was wondering just if what you're proposing with the retention walls would raise the houses a little bit back up, and so you get sure. that benefit gonna, as well. It's going to bring the houses up substantially. I, I would uh, think uh, so. If the garages uh, are going to go under. Correct, right. Right, it would bring it would bring the, the only uh, the only thing in my mind is I don't know how, what you do with the grade where the driveways terminate, and if you're going to have a retaining wall back there, how do you access your lawn from your driveway? I don't know. I, I, that's why I'm bringing it up now. I'd rather hear everybody's comments. Yeah, well, I I, you know. I don't know what you do with the grading. Do you continue to do the grading as proposed in the back to yes. to cut it back? <laughs> I, I would keep the grading in the back, but uh, bring the retaining walls in the front along the drives and then parallel to the property lines so that that natural grade of the testing locations right now could remain. But an expense? I, I, well, that's something I would discuss with the owner, yeah. It's quite For, an expense in, in cutting and, and hauling, too, so. Yeah. Well, you know, I'd rather I'd rather have the option to discuss with the owner because then right now we're talking about going back with a machine cutting the grade down to get to a point ten Elevation. feet below a, a point ten feet below where we're at right now. I I would be amenable to that idea, Bob Let's Dylan. See. How do you feel about that proposal? I, I, what would you guess the height of the elevation of the retaining walls would be at its highest along the driveway? I, I, just as Sean mentioned, probably eight feet, you know, because that's our cut. Mm -hmm. I mean, give or take. You know, right. But, but, yeah. Right. So the garage, so the garage would really be below grade. It, yeah. In it, that it, case, it would huh? naturally create. Right. Right. Reason. Right. You would ch basically would create a channel for the driveways to go up <coughs> and under the house, and then the house would sit up, and the grade would come up to meet it. And, and it would impede the the driver's view of these beautifully designed homes that we're that we're going to produce. I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Dylan, what do you think about that idea? I I mean it's. I don't, I mean, is the juice worth the squeeze? That's up to the client, I guess, because well, you you're, you're presenting a whole host of other issues uh, with that slope and that depth and the runoff in, right into the garage, but that's, you know, not right, up but if, for But us. if it's workable and... Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm going to go out and take a look at the site because it started to... Personally, I need... I mean... I think that's potentially a feasible option. I think you need to talk to the applicant about it, I mean the client, and um, and we would look at that. I think, we, I think certainly we could say, yes, we would consider that proposal. Um, All right, if uh, you could get me to comment letters, you know, as quick as possible, we're gonna try to address them right away. I'm emailing them to you right now. Doesn't get any better than that. There you go, yes. From her email, imagine they're on my plans already. Let's approve it right now and, and set the public <laughs> hearing. How's that? Any other questions? The meaning of life. No. Oh. Yeah. We're on board. <laughs> Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. That takes us to minutes.
and we have no quorums for that. Well, we only have a couple that were on the thing anyway, sure. right? So we'll have to uh, adjourn those uh, conversations to our next meeting. Does anyone have anything else that they need to cover? Noreen? Henry Farms is looking for that site walk. Ah, right. Some of us have been. Some of them have <laughs> already hiked, completed uh, <laughs> theirs. We hiked with the 90 year old. Yes, wear boots and mm -hmm. long sleeves. Yeah, I sort of figured. Um, we'll not be doing it. Right. Pat cannot. Did, did we have any input from Bonnie on when that might be feasible for her? Back and forth, the weekends is better, but then you can't get Frank Etchell. But I think Frank Etchell was talking with Vince, and he's going. Somebody's going out to look for the wells tomorrow, and Vince is okay as long as he knows when they're on and off the property. He said, "I don't want just wanderers out there." Then I go out. So he would like, they want to know when we're going to be out there. So it's basically Jeff, Dylan, Bonnie, Pat Kent, Bob's already gone, Lou has not gone. If you have any dates that you're available that I can throw out there in an email. I'm just looking at calendar. I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have... Out of what? It's beautiful. Um, Dr. Pepper, yeah. a Coke. It is. Very One and well. two. Very well. For me, I'm, I'm locked in to other things for the next several weekends, maybe possibly, probably the next month, and I don't have much time either in the evenings. So I, I get that. Um, I would say... See when, see when might work on Bonnie's schedule, and I can try and accommodate that. Is the, you know, soon I'll send her right. an email and try to get some dates again. I actually could have made the one that we had scheduled, but I didn't know it till too late for us to actually go <laughs> ahead with it. That so I apologize, I apologize for that. Otherwise, this, that part would be done. Um, I need a question for you and Sean. What's that? I have a question. I thought, don't want Ashley to leave. I have a question for her and Sean. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll make that motion. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.